Good uh, morning, still barely morning, everyone. And uh, applause well deserved for the duo we have this after this evening, morning to afternoon. I mean, I was like, whoa. I am Sherilyn Parsons. I'm the uh, founder and executive director of the Bay Area Book Festival. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you can see it's a, it's a crazy big endeavor here, so I get my mornings, afternoons, and evenings a little bit mixed up. Um, these two on stage, you have an extraordinary treat ahead. Uh, Col Colm Toybean um, has written eight novels, a lot of short story collections, and essays, and plays. Um, he's been shortlisted twice for the Booker Prize, and he also is the uh, president of the Penn Freedom to Write, uh, or the, the Penn World Voices Festival, which brings authors from all over the world. Um, the festival takes place in New York in the spring, and it's just fantastic. I went once, and it was extraordinary. Um, and the, the, the thing I think about with Colm, Colm, Colm is grace which I'm not showing at the moment, um, <laughs> is, is Grace. Grace in his writing, Grace in his demeanor. I heard him speak at the Jaipur Literature Festival this past January and um, just felt like we really want to have him come to our festival to share uh, the intelligence, uh, creative wisdom, and uh, personal grace. So we're very appreciative that he's here. Um, he also teaches at Columbia University. Um, he is the Mellon Professor in the Department of English and Comparative Literature there. And the person to his left, most of you know, but one of the connections you may not know is that Chancellor Nicholas Dirks from UC Berkeley previously was at Columbia and brought Colum to Columbia to teach. So, yeah. <laughs> so. So they have, a, they have a good connection. Um, and of course, Chancellor Dirks is um, quite a scholar and writer himself, um, very much a humanities guy. His scholarship area focuses on um, anthropology and um, India, specifically. And just one last thing about Chancellor Dirks. Um, the fact of this festival happening in Berkeley is partly due to him. About two and a half years ago, when we were considering where to locate this festival, I met with him, and he was immediately enthusiastic. And that was the precipitating factor to deciding to bring it to Berkeley. So we can thank him for that. Yes. And the uh, topic of this session is Freedom to Write, Perchance to Dream, which is a takeoff of um, a New Yorker piece that Colm, uh, Colm wrote uh, after a Freedom to Write speech that he gave at the Penn World Voices Festival. So, uh, but they may go all over the place because they have a lot of freedom of speech on this stage. <laughs> so I give to you Colm Toybean and Chancellor Nicholas Dirks. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. It's great to uh, have you all here and uh, to have this opportunity to be uh, together again with Colm, uh, who indeed I met uh, when he was recruited to come to New York to Columbia. Uh, and it was a thrill to have you uh, there at Columbia, a thrill to have you down, down the block from me where I was living. Uh, and then, of course, I left. So uh, <laughs> the whole purpose of, the, of, the, uh, of getting the festival here was to get you back so we could hang out some more. So we're going to begin by talking a little bit about the question that has been posed, and then we will probably move around to uh, topic to topic. And then we're going to have plenty of time for questions from you so that you can start thinking now about the kinds of things you'd like us to talk about. But we're, uh, we're beginning with the questions around censorship uh, and freedom to write. Uh, I'm a historian of India, in fact, and in my work on India, I began, in some ways, uh, relying on, uh, on, the, on, on censorship to find the archive that I needed to work on the development of a certain set of political movements in late 19th and 20th century South India. Uh, because I was looking for, uh, for tracks that would have particular, or, or books that would have particular political import. Uh, and I went to the, uh, to the files that were uh, uh, put together for the books that had been censored by the British colonial government 
turned out that almost everything I needed to find was there. Uh, and indeed, uh, it told the story of the kind of tensions between the rise of nationalism, the rise of caste politics, and a variety of other things, including the role that Gandhi played uh, in, in South India. He was from the North and had a somewhat outsider's uh, view. And of course, Gandhi famously was charged time after time after time, uh, not for uh, uh, disturbing the peace, not for uh, political action, but for sedition, uh, which is why he was put in prison on several different occasions. And sedition law was very, very powerful in India, and it was powerful in India in, in, in large part because of imperial anxiety around anti-colonialism, around nationalism, uh, and sedition law, uh, both uh, in some sense, even that that went back to England, developed first in imperial outposts, uh, and of course did so in, in much more draconian ways, perhaps, than, uh, than at home, where there was a sense that you had to be careful because there was a democratic relationship with, with, with the people. But where you had an imperial relationship, censorship and, 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 sed and sedition law kind of took off. Now, I'm assuming uh, that very similar kinds of things took place in Ireland. And I wanted to ask you, Colm, to begin speaking a little bit about the backdrop of, 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 of censorship and, and, and the imperial relationship and kinds of tensions and anxieties around politics that, as an Irish writer, and I say that only as one of many things you are, uh, and I know you've already spoken about that in a, in a panel, uh, is the kind of uh, uh, way in which the literary traditions that, that, that you now are so much a part of uh, must have been inflected in very heavy and important ways. Yeah, uh, uh, Ireland and India have in common the idea that they were both becoming nations without becoming states. And therefore, the, uh, the, uh, what was said, because there was no parliament, Therefore, speech itself, utterance, what was written, took on an extra importance in places where there was that vacuum. And therefore, um, in Ireland, a number of figures, mainly W.B. Yeats and his friend Lady Gregory, realized that if Ireland had a national theater, that that theater would have enormous implications for the creation or the reimagining of a nation, which in turn would have political implications. Now, Lady Gregory owned a great deal of land. Her husband had been governor of Ceylon. Um, he'd been director of the National Gallery. He was 35 years older than her. He left her a widow at 40 in 1890. And she was a very powerful figure. You know, that when she was in Venice, she stayed with Lady Ly Lyard. And when, for, you know, when the Queen um, came through um, Venice. Of course, the Queen came to sup with Lady Gregory, who in, in the meantime, when she was back in Ireland, w was involved in, in the most interesting way in trying to deal with this matter of censorship and the British view of Ireland as somehow a place that had to be very, very carefully watched. She lent her considerable power to Ireland. When people said to her, but you're becoming a home ruler, she said, no. I'm interested in what would happen after home rule. And then she would also say no. She was very good at saying no. No, I want to give dignity to Ireland. And of course, nobody could argue with, I want to give dignity to Ireland. It sounds such a sweet, nice thing to do, to give dignity to Ireland. So W.B. Yeats, staying in her house, cool in the west of Ireland, um, in 1900, had a dream. And the dream was that an old woman came to a house, and the old woman was Ireland. She, she was Ireland. And by the end of the dream, the old woman had become, she had the walk of a queen, a young and beautiful woman, had been utterly transformed in the dream to have the walk of a queen. And they realized they were going to put this on the stage. It was going to be called Kathleen Nihulahan, which is one of the names for Ireland. And they put this on the stage in Dublin, and all the young men who were interested in revolution came to watch it. The idea that um, they set it, of course, in 1798, the year, of course, of the French, the year of the rebellion in Ireland against the British. The woman represented rebellion, so that she only had, she became a young woman when news came that the French had come to liberate Ireland from the British. Somehow that transformation on the stage, what happened in the small theater, had enormous impact on the country. If I were the British, I would have closed it down there and then. This was going to become the most dangerous 
thing possible, a national theatre. Lady Gregory said, no, no, don't worry, we're fine. We just want to put on nice Irish plays by young Irish writers, give the young men something to do, give the young actors something to do. And the British sort of nodded, that seemed reasonable. And then, of course, um, realised that the patent, which was the most, um, the, the patent they got was only for new Irish plays. That, but that the writ of the Lord Chancellor, which was a savage form of censorship of theatre, which went on in England into the 1960s, where really the Queen had the right, and the, Queen Elizabeth, the current Queen, did look at the, at the manuscript of plays that were to go on to decide should they or shouldn't they. It didn't actually, they just hadn't bothered stretching the law to Ireland they thought that, because, because there were no theatres that mattered in Ireland. So George Bernard Shaw wrote a play in which a man shakes his fist at God. The Lord Chancellor said, oh, well, that's not going on. It was called the, the shoeing up of Blanco Posnet. The, um, in England, they said, this, this cannot possibly go on. And George Bernard Shaw went to Lady Gregory and said, you know, you can put it on in Dublin without any trouble. <laughs> and so she began to direct the play. And the Lord Lieutenant in Dublin said, Lady Gregory, it's, you know, your theatre is so wonderful, but this play is so wrong. And... Um, and you, you could lose your patent. So herself and W.B. Yeats um, let him go very far, released all the information about the argument they were having with him, and then put the play on. And of course, they, they, all the young men who had come in as revolutionaries came again. They had been defying, this play defied, it's a very bad play, it defied, <laughs> um, I have to say, James Joyce was back from Trieste at this point. He thought it was the worst thing he'd ever seen. But there was a fervor, but there was a fervor in the audience, um, not just about the theater or shaking your fist at God, but we had defied the British in Dublin. Now, the big question then was, what was Lady Gregory going to do with the foundation of the new Irish state? So in 1922, the state was founded. Her second W.B. Yeats were really exhausted trying to keep the theatre open during the six years of violence in the city. They kept it open. But they went to the new government and said, look, why don't you, make, why don't you take it over? It, become, it becomes a government theatre. The government was wise enough to know, don't, no, no, but we will subsidise you. So the Abbey Theatre in Dublin became the first subsidised theatre from the state in the English language. It already had happened in Scandinavia. But in the English language, it, it got a state subsidy. And then the problem arose, of course, um, in 1925. The playwright Sean O'Casey, who was a born troublemaker, he was a communist, um, he had not even taken part in the 1916 rebellion, wrote a play called The Plough and the Stars. And The Plough and the Stars did not um, satisfy the need people had for the 10th anniversary of the 1916 rebellion for the, for the leaders to be portrayed in the theatre as heroes. He portrayed them as less than heroic, as oddly human. He made the looters, the ordinary people of Dublin who got fur coats out of the occasion, he made them into the sort of heroes. And um, the, the government had one um, member, sort of unofficial member of the board, the first Catholic to be on the board. And um, he said, you know, if you put this play on, you will lose your subsidy. And Lady Gregory, it's a marvellous moment in the history of censorship, said to him, now you tell the government, she, she was a marvellous, once you challenged her, she really rose to the occasion. And she said, now you tell the government one thing for me. If it's a choice between the subsidy and our freedom, we will always take our freedom. And then she managed to get the subsidy as well. <laughs> you know, that, that in other words, she challenged and won. And the play went on, and of course there were riots in the theatre. The widows of the men who had been executed came to the theatre and walked out ceremoniously, and they had enormous power in the city. Um, there had previously been riots in the theatre over the Playboy The Western World um, by John Millington Singh in 1907 because portrayed young Irish women as less than pure. And, and, you know, so that they were, th they, th th the theatre was this dangerous place. But what was very interesting now was, um, W.B. Yeats said, um, because the police had to be called the previous time, this time we'll call the police again, but it will be your own police. This, you know, this is your country. And this is, um, if you want to do this, uh, the, and, you know, if you want to disrupt the play, we will call the police. But this time it will be the Irish police. 
And um, the play went on, and it remains to this day. I mean, I mean, it's on, I think it's probably even on in the theatre at the moment. It's been one of the most successful plays commercially that the Abbey Theatre has put on. But, but I think it was a great moment in the history of censorship in the 1920s in Ireland, and then um, other forces got to work. And really, by the end of the 1920s, independence comes 1922, 1923. By 1929, there's a piece of legislation put through Parliament in Dublin, really, that sets up a most draconian system of censorship. So that, um, I, I was talking about this yesterday, that all anyone had to do was merely, if a book, any book came out, just underline a passage you didn't like, send, send it to the censorship board, and more or less automatically, the censorship board said, we are banning this book. And um, this went right through until 1966. And um, the list of writers who were banned were, are the list of anyone who was publishing seriously in those years. It, and, and it was ludicrous, but it was done by us. And the second part of the censorship, which, was, which went right through into the 1970s, was the censorship of film. Um, I mean, a lot of films were banned, but the ones that weren't banned were cut. The censor literally had a scissors. And, um, for example, there's a scene in Fellini's Amarcord that I saw Amarcord, Fellini's Amarcord, in Dublin in 1974. And then years later when I saw it, there was one scene where all the boys masturbate together that I thought, when? I don't, that, that wasn't the... Oh, I know. <laughs> the censor literally, with the scissors, actually cut that. So that I suppose the issue is that, that in societies where, and I think India is another example of this, where the word has been important, where a single utterance, a single speech by somebody, you know, because there are no elections to parliament, because there's no system of discourse that has been established slowly over a period of a thousand years, as say was hap hap had happened in Britain and to some extent in France and other European countries, mm -hmm. wasn't there. Therefore, a single individual's voice mattered enormously, a book, a single copy of a book handed around to people could matter enormously. A play could actually, I mean, I mean, Yeats eventually wrote at the end of his life, did that play of mine send out certain men the English shot? And the answer is yes, it did. That it was that play that caused uh, the beginnings of the, of, of the stirring of the sort of emotion that gave rise in turn to the 1916 rebellion. And so, the whole idea of the written word and, what, and, and the power of the written word, um, I, I think, is something that we know a great deal about um, in Ireland. And I, I think Indians also understand that, um, and, you know, that, that therefore any governing power, for example, I think it's something that the government of China is absolutely alert to, the government of Saudi Arabia, indeed the government of Russia is alert to. And then, of course, we, you know, that, that, so that it's, it's, it's something that really matters in places where there are vacuums. And uh, in India then, how did the British go about, I mean, did they ever lose those battles? I mean, was it ever the case where, I mean, you can really make fun of a censor under certain conditions? Well, you know, the same thing you describe uh, uh, for taking uh, a play or a film or uh, for that matter, a, a, a work of fiction, uh, and coding political things, but doing so in, uh, in displaced and, um, and subtle and non-obvious ways, but obvious enough to the audience, uh, took place uh, regularly. The same, pla same uh, process you described for censorship of film uh, took place when I first was in India as a kid. In the 60s, I remember seeing films and you know, there would just be these gaps. And you know, again, it was the censor's scissor, and, and that was uh, that was that. But the the, the effort on, on on the part of the British in India was to uh, was was to try themselves not to say we are censoring something because it is uh, politically dangerous for us. The effort was to say uh, we are censoring something because it will cause unrest. And so, as censorship law developed in the in the 20th century, it developed around the premise that uh, it would be a bad thing to, 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 uh, uh, to have riots between communities. 
or riots between caste groups. And so uh, the, the terms of censorship were increasingly about uh, uh, preserving order and minimizing uh, uh, unrest. Uh, as a result, those laws still are in the books. And the process you describe, you know, going from to self-rule, uh, often doesn't look quite as dramatic as, uh, as people thought back in the, back in the days of nationalist uh, agitation. Uh, and, you know, for example, when Salman Rushdie's satanic uh, verses was, uh, was censored in India, and it was, it was censored around the notion that it was going to give offense to a particular community, would lead to unrest, and therefore it was not uh, in, the social, in, in, the, in the interest of social order to allow it to be published. But it's a very different kind of way of, 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 of justifying uh, and describing what censorship is, is, is all about. It takes a value in this, in this case of social order. The last big case in Ireland was the case of the writer John McGahern. Um, and um, he had published a wonderful first novel called The Barracks. And um, he was working as a teacher in a school in Dublin. And he wrote a second novel called The Dark. And uh, the, the dark now looks so innocent. It's just the boy masturbates, which in, in a way was going on, I think, throughout the country at that time. You know, perhaps no one was writing about it, but everyone was doing it, or every, everyone was everyone was old enough. And um, but he, but he was away when the book came out. Um, you know, he was on a year's leave of absence, and in that year he had met a Finnish woman and he had married her in a registry office. I mean, not in a Catholic ceremony. And he arrived back, uh, arrived back into the country to find that A, his book had been banned, but B, that the Archbishop of Dublin had instructed the Catholic Archbishop that um, he was to be fired from his job. And um, so he came back into the school and he described, uh, um, I knew him very well, he's, um, and he's dead 10 years now, and, uh, and uh, he, he described, um, he said, what did you marry a foreign woman for? And John said, well, I had been in love with her. I said, but they're Irish women looking for husbands with their tongues hanging out. <laughs> and there was a complete, and, and the book was banned. And he, um, his name, I mean, I was talking about this yesterday where um, my parents had three books hidden on top of a wardrobe. Um, Couples by John Updike, The Dark by John McGarhern. I mean, I found them. I was looking around the room. And, um, the, and The Country Girls by Edna O'Brien. But, but, but part of the, um, um, of the reason for the lifting of censorship is interesting. That um, by the end of the 1950s, it was very clear that the Irish um, attempt to have a fully closed economy was not succeeding. In other words, that um, um, unemployment was going down, there was absolutely no growth. Um, what the IMF and the World Bank said is this is the strangest country. It's, it's, um, it's, it's, it hasn't had growth for 100 years, while other economies with Marshall Plan money or for various other reasons had been growing. Um, you, know, you know, in the 1950s, Ireland just went down and down and down. Even people were starting to talk about, and there are, there's a book called The Disappearing Irish, because anyone who could was going to England or America or Australia. But by the, um, in 1959, the government published a first program for economic expansion, which is really to say the, con the, the economy will be fully open, suddenly and fully opened. And as a result, the World Bank was going to be involved, and the IMF was going to be involved, and the country was going to attempt to become very quickly cosmopolitan, um, economically. And of course, they became hugely embarrassed then by the censorship laws. Um, the, uh, the, the, the writer Ivan Boland, who teaches at Stanford, her father, Freddie Boland, was um, the assistant to the Prime Minister, Eamon de Valera, um, who, um, when Ireland joined the League of Nations in the 1930s, would travel from Dublin to Switzerland, to Geneva, and to Zurich. He um, had, this, uh, had more or less the same eye problem as James Joyce did, and Joyce was living in Zurich by this time, and they were both seeing the same eye doctor. And one day, Freddie Boland was going up in the elevator, this is in the 1930s, in the hospital, and the woman in, introduced herself as Nora Joyce. She was going to see, uh, and her husband was briefly just having a, in the hospital. And she contacted him and said, um, my husband, James Joyce, would like to meet Eamon de Valera, the Prime Minister. By this time, Joyce was one of the most distinguished novelists in the world. He had published Ulysses in 1922. Mm -hmm. And so Freddie Boland had to go back to the Irish Prime Minister, 
who had nothing else to do, I mean, at that time, and he wasn't so he was busy, you know, you know, and uh, I mean, he was free that evening, he was free the next evening, and um, James Joyce would like to have supper with you or meet you, and De Valera said, no, I, I have nothing in common with him. It's the man that wrote that book, and nothing, mm -hmm. and he didn't meet him. And um, what happened then is very interesting. When um, John Kennedy was coming to Ireland um, in June 1963, Arthur Schlesinger wrote his speech to be, de to be delivered to the joint houses um, of Parliament. And out of mischief, out of badness, out, out of a wake, uh, as a way of a wake-up call to the Irish government, June 1963, they, and, and they were putting in the names of illustrious Irish people. They added in the name James Joyce. <laughs> and Schlesinger told me this, and I thought that, could, that couldn't have happened. But I look back, if you look back, it's there in the speech, um, Kennedy, talking to Parliament. Eamon de Valera by this time is President of Ireland and he has to sit and listen now <laughs> as James Joyce is being declared by the President of the United States to be, um, uh, James Joyce is declared to be a great Irishman. And, um, but, but I think this idea of, of that, um, it just didn't suit um, Ireland uh, for economic reasons now to have this draconian system of book censorship. It made us look backward and strange in a time when we were trying to look outwards and, mo and be modern. modern. Yeah. And so the culture, in a way, became another tool that could be used, which, which I think is something else that um, it's, it's a strange form of censorship in a way where, where you double censorship back on itself and you say, no, we need you now. You know, we need young writers to be around in the country in order to um, get more loans from the IMF, which is the sort of strangest idea, which of course occurs in the United States mm -hmm. um, it, more or less the same time as the CIA start to fund the magazine Encounter. Encounter, yeah. And, and, um, well, which is a very interesting history because of course the, uh, the principal value that had to be exported by the US was the freedom uh, from censorship. So uh, Encounter was funded. Uh, a lot of intellectuals in Europe and possibly in Ireland too were, were funded, were given grants. They didn't know exactly uh, why and from whom. Uh, and the idea was simply to express the, uh, the vitality of, of, of American cultural life. Uh, and of course it would be nice if there were nice things said about Americans. And there were nice things said about Americans and American writers, some of whom of course uh, would have the same kind of uh, reaction in, uh, in, 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 in D.C. if you mention them as great Americans yeah. uh, at the same time. But let me, can I ask you, a, kind of bring this up to the present and mm -hmm. ask you uh, a, a difficult question, but one that you know, clearly is being thought about a lot across this country now. Uh, you teach, of course, uh, in a department of English, and uh, you teach Joyce and you teach Yeats and Singh and so on and so forth, and there's no, no problem. Uh, but at Columbia last year, there was a big debate about, uh, about the place of certain texts on the core curriculum, including Ovid. And there are, of course, uh, growing concerns about uh, the way in which certain kinds of literature can trigger uh, very problematic reactions on the part of, uh, of students who are survivors of one sort or another of violence. Do you have a sense that the debates that we've had over the, over, the, over the decades are going to come back, whether in that guise, whether around uh, uh, clearly the sort of uh, pr prevalent role that this idea of political correctness has now attained in, in, in terms of the, the political campaign, uh, but more generally in terms of uh, the kinds of ways in which, however much we might pride ourselves on being modern and being committed to freedom of speech, speech continues to be dangerous and writing continues to provoke all kinds of reactions that can often be very disturbing. I think that this requires great sensitivity and care, and I think the first rule is that the classroom is a safe space for students, and that no student in a classroom feels belittled by a text. Now, this doesn't mean that you, that there, that you have to say, well, we, there are therefore texts we cannot read. But it does mean, um, I'll give you, the, I mean, the, the best example I know is, I was, when I was starting to teach in America, I put The Sun Also Rises by Ernest Hemingway on the course in the new school in New York because I loved the book and I thought there was something I could say about it. And when I went back to read it, I saw that there was a Jewish figure in the book 
and the way things, the things that were said about him were clearly not just casual anti-Semitic, but were there from the author, were, mm -hmm. were, were, were quite cruel. And that this was going to require serious thought on my part as to how I was going to deal with this. So I went in straight away and said, look, we've got to deal with this I immediately. Um, and, and I need someone else to lead it for me. Um, you know, you've all been reading the book too. Like, like, what am I going to do now about this book with you so that we can try and read the book for its style? Can we still do that? Do you think we can still do that? And, um, and what I was almost trying to do was look to say, look, I'm, an, I'm innocent here. I'm an Irish Catholic. It, is there a Jewish person in this class that's going to get me out of this particular hole? I've dug myself. And one guy just took it up and went with it. And, and um, you know, that they, they actually were insisting we were going to continue with the text and that we were going to face this directly. But it never goes away. Hemingway, Hemingway won't help you. Try, try doing his story, The Killers, which is a really fascinating story stylistically. It, it's one of the great moments where so much is left out. We don't know why the killers are coming to kill the man. He knows he's going to be killed. Why? It's never told. This idea of the withholding of information, which, which makes its way then into the spare style of Hemingway's. It's really an important story in the history of modern style, modern prose style. Oh dear, the N-word. There's a boy in the kitchen who's referred to constantly. Just when you're trying to show a sentence about style, he comes back out of the kitchen and is referred to using the N-word. And you go, you're breaking my heart, Ernest Hemingway. <laughs> and, and, in, 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 and again, the only way to do this is in the absolutely straightforward way to ask the students what you should do, what they should do, how we should deal with this. And, but, but, but all the time insisting that, you know, like. We're clearly not going to throw the story out because of its importance, of its stylistic importance. But nonetheless, we cannot leave this matter out. And it comes up with certain other texts. Um, Yeats's poem, Lead and the Swan, I mentioned to you earlier, which I'm going to teach in January. Is we have to face the idea that this is a man writing a poem about a rape. And he's writing it with a sort of interest in the male power um, he isn't questioning, in a way, male power. He's sort of glorifying it. And it, it, there are about 10 ways of reading the poem, but that has to become one of them. And perhaps it's a useful thing. And um, it, it just won't go away. And the only way to do it in, in, that, that I have found useful is to let the students lead it. Um, I mean, there was a funny moment where um, the House of Mirth and again, you're trying to just, you want to talk about, there are many, many things to talk about, including the way uh, that, that, the, that for almost the first time, this idea of a woman's consciousness is being, is being um, dramatized and dealt with in a new way by Edith Wharton in the House of Mirth. But of course, there's a Jewish figure. And of course, the Jewish figure is undermined in a way which isn't ordinary. And... Uh, uh, I'm in Colombia, and I say to the students, OK, I need someone else to lead this. Uh, can someone else just take this over from me for a minute and take us through it and see what, you, see, see what we're going to do about this? And then I said, uh, and can, can it, you know, again, trying the Irish Catholic card, how many, how many are, you know, is, is anyone Jewish? And out of the 15, 13 hands went up. You know? <laughs> and I said, great, I think we're in exactly the right place now for, to, to, you know, to deal with this once and for all. But, but of course, they then became really intelligent. I mean, once the power was handed to them to deal with this. I mean, uh, but it was absolutely clear we weren't going to say, we're not reading this book. I mean, I, mean, I think we, we, that has to come from me in a way to say, you know, no matter what we do, this book remains an important book um, by a writer you know, th that, th whose, whose work we have to interrogate here in many, many ways. But, but perhaps before we go on, we have to look at this. Can you lead it? Can someone else lead it? Because if I start telling you how to feel, because this is sometimes about sensitivity, if I start telling you how to feel, you have an absolute right to, to tell me back. No, no, y you can tell me what you think but you can't tell me what I should feel, so that you 
so that it's, it's almost a way of working with students to get the students to tell you um, what they, how they themselves would navigate these stormy waters if they were leading the class. And just stop leading and start following and start listening. Um, I, I, I think at those very difficult times. Um, and there's also the, I mean, the larger question of, say, misogyny. Um, just the larger question of the canon itself. Um, I noticed the Yale undergraduates announced last week, um, I noticed at the end of the semester, so they must feel pretty free um, to say that, uh, that they didn't want to read as many uh, white male poets as before. And um, you, you know, that, that they're, they're, the canon, the whole idea of what you read, I mean, that, I think it would be no longer possible over, say, a 14-week semester to have books only by men. I think that day is over now. And if you say, well, you know, there aren't, there isn't a woman equal to James Joyce, well, actually, try Elizabeth Bowen for a change and see what she's doing. And you find that actually something extraordinary you know, will happen in a classroom with the book, the last, with her novel, The Last September, which, you know, 30 years ago, people might not have thought that she could be put in the same league as Joyce but that actually we do have to become immensely sensitive to the fact that the canon cannot remain this, this imprisoned space where we've imprisoned Milton, you know, and we've imprisoned Joyce, and we've imprisoned Wallace Stevens, mm -hmm. that we somehow have to allow the prison to be a co-ed space. <laughs> you know, that's a wonderful, wonderful way of putting it. You know, in a way, uh, whether you think back to the 1980s and the culture wars as they, as they raged at the time, and of course, uh, one of the expressions, uh, of course, being uh, the closing of the American mind, Alan Bloom, uh, whether you think about some of the debates today, uh, whether you think about it in terms of the canon or whether you think about it in terms of what you read and how you read, in, in a way, it is continuous with this whole history of censorship because, of course, the conceit on the one side is that fiction is about personal life, it's not political. And of course we know everything that goes on inside our lives and across our lives and therefore in fiction and in poetry and, uh, and, and the like is, uh, is, is full of politics. And it, it's precisely that, 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 that fluid boundary between uh, what is and what is not political that is there to be worked on, to, there to be played with, there to be uh, uh, taken further by, uh, by writers, by, by creative souls and the like. But that being said, I guess the question I want to ask you is, uh, how do you see yourself, if, 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 if it would be the case that all writing is political in one way or another, uh, your writing has nevertheless uh, not been explicitly political in the formal sense. I want to turn to some of your writing. I just had the great pleasure of reading Nora Webster on a flight uh, yesterday coming back uh, and uh, back to California, and there's a little bit of the troubles, there's a little bit of uh, politics in the background. The daughter, Nora's daughter, is, uh, is involved in a protest and is concerned that she might have disappeared or been imprisoned or even uh, uh, killed in a, in, a, in a massacre. But it's off stage. It's there in a powerful way and not there. And I don't want to give other examples right now, but I'd love to hear you speak a little bit about how uh, you yourself think about politics when you write fiction? Um, some of this arose really from thinking about the novel form and what the novel can do and perhaps what I thought I should do with the novel. So that in those two novels, Brooklyn and Nora Webster, I was absolutely alert that my main um, responsibility um, was to the, to the main character. So I was looking carefully at early Velázquez paintings before Velázquez went to Madrid and began to paint the royals. He was in Seville, and he painted faces, vulnerable faces of ordinary people in Seville, a man selling water, a woman frying an egg. And you get from those faces a sense, I fully know this person from the shading of the face, from the way the eye is done, a person who is utterly powerless, 
the novel comes as a democratic form in, 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 in the way that you know, there are very few, I mean, you, there are probably are novels about kings and queens, but they don't need to be about kings and queens. The novel allows an ordinary person to emerge in full. Now, if you're working with something like Irish emigration, which has been the huge subject, I mean, you know, it really is the secret history of Ireland over 150 years. And as I was writing Brooklyn for the first time, people were coming into Ireland as, as emigrants from outside, and Ireland was treating them very badly and suspiciously. So I could write a pamphlet on this subject of migration, of what migration does, of what it means, of the different ways in which our, our Ireland has affected the United States, um, it's it's involved, Irish involvement in the Labour Party in England, um, the, the, the police force in New York, firemen, all those things. I, I could write a history book about them. But I want to write a book where a single individual face, like a face in a Vermeer painting, will appear to you and I will give you all of the feelings that she has. Um, I will give you her sadness, her isolation, but I will also give you her powerlessness as a sort of power. I will make what she feels not, I will not try and make it to stand for 150 years of feeling, but I will try and make it powerful enough so that the next time you go into a supermarket and see the Lithuanian girl at the checkout looking slightly sad, you will see something that I have given you from the making of one character alone. And so with Nora Webster, uh, that th this is set in the 1960s in Ireland, I, and there was every possibility to, for example, bring in the troubles in Northern Ireland and really let them loose in the novel. And I could easily have done that because I have, you know, I, I, I reported it from Northern Ireland like, like, I, like I knew what was going on. I could have done research into many other areas. But by just giving Nora Webster, making herself herself, I was trying to win a space for the novel um, as an autonomous place that had more power in a way than if you wrote history or if you wrote a pamphlet or if you gave your opinions simply by the drawing of one particular character. That in other words, um, how we imagine one other person is actually how we live. And that that becomes in turn political is how we imagine someone we don't know. But then how we slowly imagine someone we do know is actually the most important thing we probably do in our lives, more indeed than imagining ourselves, the one other person we need to imagine, know, understand, and share feelings with. So that you give that to the reader, but the implications are that by giving that to the reader, you are working on the reader's imagination. Once you allow that possibility in, that we, we, we can begin to imagine others, then we can do so in, the, in, in a more abstract way, uh, and that it might actually change people in various ways. And um, I, I mean, this then becomes a, a nightmare when you try and think, well, did the novel ever save a single life in Nazi Germany? You know, like, like what are you talking about? But all, all, all I'm saying is the form is a delicate form. It, it's not necessarily uh, you know, a parliament, it's not a police force, but it, 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 its, its power is delicate and fragile. But almost because of that, because someone is reading alone and in silence, that, that way of reading alone and in silence can change the reader, can actually change someone in the way they feel, perhaps even in the time of reading. So I was certainly alert in Nora Webster to try and win space for the novel, uh, autonomous space for the idea of the single individual in the novel having a sentimental life, a personal life, a private life, and allowing public life to be, as you would often see in Italian Renaissance paintings, just in the distance, you yeah, would have a yeah. you know, hill city. Right. But, but I certainly was alert to the idea of... But you did, you did one thing very, very powerfully, which was when she joins, when Nora joins the Union, she goes to the meeting. Now she is a woman who is often, uh, often feels as if her agency is taken over by others, right? So that she is frequently expressing the sense that she doesn't know why she's doing something. She takes a vacation because Josie just implores her day after day, night after night. But she goes to the meeting 
And once she's gone there, she can't go home. And of course, she has to join the union. She can't be there and not do so. But it's a very uh, powerful way of saying that, you know, that what looked like, perhaps in retrospect, or in historical accounts or political accounts, uh, very clear, very deliberate, very uh, huge breaks of a kind that uh, have to do with political organization, with political affiliation, political identity, political action, uh, that it's often much more complicated, that events, the relationship yeah. between where you are and what you're doing and how political events unfold have that same dimension through the face, through the person, through the individual. Yeah, you're playing a game almost with the public and the private all the time, where you know, there's one section about getting her hair done as a big decision. But you think, I actually need one thing to make, to deepen the novel in some way. She does something, a, a, a public gesture, that is going to have implications for her at work. And the joining of the union became that. And, and, and there was, I mean, I mean, if you did research, you'd find that there was a lot of unionization of those small companies in Ireland mm -hmm. in those very years. I mean, this is something you could do research on. But, um, but, but I'm still playing a game all the time of trying to bring you back to her face, to her interior life as she faces one of these sort of public dilemmas. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you one more question about another novel, and then we're going to open this up for, for questions from, the, from, from you. Uh, the first novel of yours I read was The Master, uh, and I just thought it was exquisite, just wonderful. After reading the novel, fortunately afterwards, I uh, did read a review uh, that was in the New York Times by Daniel Mendelssohn. And um, you know, he said very nice things about the novel, but he challenged uh, your account of, uh, of, of, of James, uh, and did so around, uh, around how you evaluated his, uh, his tenacious uh, hold to his privacy, uh, and, uh, and especially around his sexuality or his presumed sexuality. I was just curious if you would say a little bit about uh, how you responded to, uh, to the review. I don't know if you did formally or not, but more, uh, more to the point, uh, how in your, uh, in your evocation of, of James, uh, you thought about a life that has been, uh, particularly in recent decades, evaluated uh, in particular around his sexuality as opposed to how he might have construed notions of pleasure and life and self-expression and ultimately uh, the values that he wanted to um, right, write about Well, well I'll answer this. Um, I, I mean, it was a long review. I, I did read it, and the next time I met the author of it, I smiled at him and nodded. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was taught to do that in school. That was how you dealt with every issue that came before you smiled and nodded. Um, and, um, what happened was um, that um, William James, Henry James' older brother, had a very formidable wife called Alice. He had a sister called Alice. She's dead by the time Henry James is dying. So, but there's also another Alice, who's William James's wife. She crosses the Atlantic as Henry James is dying. Um, it's a dangerous place, the Atlantic, in 1916, and, and she crosses it. And um, first of all, she takes over the house immediately. She says that no further messages are to be sent to that ghastly woman, Edith Wharton. She loathes, she's a, you know, she's a Boston matron and she can't stand the idea of Edith Wharton. And so she bans anything about Edith Wharton. She fires various people from the household and she takes over. Meaning that when Henry James dies in um, February, or, um, um, you know, a hundred years ago, she, um, in, um, in 1916, she gets control of his estate. I mean, he leaves everything to her and her sons in his will. They then became, become deeply concerned about what she calls poor, silly Uncle Harry. Uncle Harry had written these letters to younger men, which really are not helpful if you're a Boston matron and um, the desperation they faced as to keep Uncle Harry in the closet. So that um, in 1930, when Heinrich Andersen, who had 74 of these letters written to him, he was a beautiful young sculptor in Rome, Henry James wanted to hold him, embrace him, be with him, I mean, it just goes on, asked to publish these letters, which are marvellous letters. The James family said, absolutely, under no circumstances, can you publish them? 
They weren't published until the year 2000. Mm -hmm. um, the James family then set about um, stopping anything about their uncle. This is Harry and Billy, his two nephews, who were, who were, who were based in Boston around Harvard. So that even a scholar who wanted to get into the Houghton Library to see material would be stopped by the Jameses and vetted by the Jameses. They chose Leonie Dell because they thought they, to, you know, to write the biography because they thought they could trust him. They, they exercised enormous control over him, including Billy, who you know just said, "Oh, that he was doing an edition of letters. Some of those letters are too sad. Leave them out." And they controlled an almighty control. I mean, they, they exercised an almighty control on the estate until sometime um, in the 1990s, when it passed on. I mean, the, the, the next generation ex exercised the control, and then it passed on to the next generation, who realized, of course, that Uncle Harry would become much more interesting if he turned out to be gay all along. In other words, the world had changed, so Uncle Harry could not change, and he wasn't on the curriculum anymore because you know, people like him were being moved off the curriculum. But if he was suddenly on, not as a dead white male, but as a gay white male, he would suddenly be on you know, his work. And there was a scholar called E. Eve Sedgwick, who began the campaign in a wonderful book called Epistemology of the Closet, to really out James. Mm -hmm. And to out James, to make the work doubly interesting, hugely ambiguous, filled with nuance. And people began to study him in a whole new way. A whole new world opened up for him. And um, a new biography came, which was much more explicit about um, you know, his, um, his private life. And, um, and then I come into the picture, realizing this is the most interesting thing that's going on at the moment, as far as I'm concerned, this queering of Henry James. What I'm going to try and do is try and play it both ways, which might be what Daniel Mendelssohn minded most, you know, that I, 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 that I don't allow him to have a huge sex scene. I, I mean, I wanted to give him one. The nearest thing he gets to sex in my book is that in the other room, Heinrich Anderson clearly it's night, he's gone to bed, and he's clearly taking off his clothes, and James begins to imagine, bit by bit, as he removes various garments, he's lying in bed, here's his shoe dropping. That dropping of the shoe is the most erotic thing in the book. <laughs> but he's in the other room. James does not cross the corridor. So it's that James, James being very, very careful. He was not Oscar Wilde. He did not flaunt his sexuality. He did not get into trouble over his sexuality. And the, the, the other issue was that um, I felt the more I looked at the letters and the more I looked, um, and of course, more and more letters were now appearing. Mm -hmm. The Heinrich Anderson letters had appeared, but other letters had appeared. And the archive was now, was now open. That I felt there was, that he was a great, that he was a much more haunted figure that he might have appeared before. And the, and the parts of that um, were appearing in, in the novels. But also, the best novels, think about it, Portrait of a Lady, Wings of the Dove, Golden Bowl, The Ambassadors, have a secret which, if known, will be explosive. And that is not there in George Eliot, it's not there in James Joyce, it's not there in Joseph Conrad. I think, well, this, this comes from, a, I began to try and connect that to a source which wasn't exactly fear, but was that whole idea of reticence in James, of knowing um, that, 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 that if he were fully known as a person, he would not be received in the same way he as he was being received socially in London. And that, that tension between what was within and, um, and what was on display was actually giving him a huge amount of energy, mm -hmm. which is making its way into the novels, and that I found I could work with in other words, I, I was working with levels of ambiguity and tension within his personality, which had become apparent, much more apparent in the previous decade, uh, as I was working. And so that's what the book was trying to yeah. deal with. And you see, obviously, this is hugely open to question, because anyone reading him, I mean, I, mean, I picked 11 episodes from his life and made a chapter from each of them. If I gave you all the information I had, each of us here would pick 11 different chapters and they would tell us more about who we are uh, than James. And so that yeah. is one of the ways why James remains our contemporary, because, no, because we still are reading him ambiguously f for the mystery in the work, 
which we still haven't come to terms with, um, which I think is, has happen, happens also with a figure like Shakespeare, mm -hmm. where we don't know, and the not knowing is, is the most interesting space um, as you start to read a text, not knowing where the text, how the text arose, what tensions gave rise to it, uh, and also th there's no complete and full and exact way for it to be read. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Terrific. So let's hear from you. Yeah? There, there, there are mics uh, that are going to be brought. We have, we have a question right question down the front. The front row. Um, we, we, oh. Oh. Oh, 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 I'm oh. sorry. Okay. Oh, right. You <laughs> Thank you for a wonderful conversation. Um, so Professor Toibin, I thought you described beautifully uh, how fiction makes us more emphatic. And, uh, and it made me, reminded me of a poem by a German poet Holderlin who said, uh, what are poets for in a destitute time? And he says that they um, unshield us from the nature of pain, love, and death. And, um, and I was thinking, uh, even though when we want to go to writers or poets to uh, to you know, unshield us, we end up, you, through political reasons that you, uh, Chancellor, was mentioning, to go towards writers who are from our own identity. Like you know, some Italians would go read Italian writers, or Jewish. If you're from Jewish identity, you end up. Re so you end up like confirming your own biases in some sense. So what do you think? Uh, how can you know, literature be diversified so people are. Uh, can explore these various thoughts and not stay linked uh, to just one particular thought in literature? And, um, or, or is there a certain novel that could encompass the diversity that exists in our world now because we don't live in these secluded lands anymore that every character is, you know, is a mix of this part particular identity. We are more globalized now. And is that happening in literature? And then uh, my second uh, question to you. <laughs> Let's, uh, I'm sorry, my second question is uh, Bloom's Day is on June 16th coming up. How do you celebrate? Um, well, I think that the whole idea um, of the novel especially, but I mean also theatre, of, uh, of allowing us to see something that we didn't know before is actually essential. It's, it's, it's not as though we go to a novel asking us to confirm things that we, that we already believe. So it's been terribly important, for example, in my lifetime, what has happened with the emergence of, say, the Indian novel in English, or the South American novel, um, that, that, and even novels which destabilize the novel form, which, which, which seem written you know, by, by someone entirely new, I mean, written in an entirely new way, using voice or the sentence or narrative structure in an entirely new way. And I, what, what I want to say about this is that um, the country closest to mine is England, and we might see it in many ways as a country that's caused us nothing but harm. Um, but that's not entirely true. I mean, we have to be careful about this. That, the, that um, my grandfather fought in the 1916 rebellion, and he was imprisoned by the British afterwards. And the, the, there was a great hatred in the family for certain figures in British government. But they didn't allow that to interfere with their reading of Charles Dickens. They felt that Charles Dickens belonged fundamentally to them. And um, that, that whole free flow, I think that it's easy to talk about the European Union as being for slow learners. You know, in other words, that was, that was already happening, um, where we got to know certain things. For example, anyone who read Doris Lessing got to know, who was a man, got to know something about being a woman um, that would not have been apparent in other ways. And I think the novel mattered in that sort of way. But, um, but uh, the, the, so, so the form is very powerful in that sense. Um, that, and, and what's really important is that we, that we translate more books, that we, that, that, that we read writers, that we don't just actually um, have a you know read about Syrians as refugees that the Syrians write the books just that and we're reading a novel by a Syrian about Syria rather than reading the New York Times well as well as reading the New York Times journalist about Syria so so so, so that whole idea you know, which I think became very important in Northern Ireland 
where figures like Seamus Heaney and Derek Mahan you know, were writing poetry f as people from Northern Ireland about identity, the landscape, or, or just about uh, their place began to matter in a time of strife to the whole world. And also, Heaney is very interesting about this idea that um, he said, well, you know, can your poems make peace? He said, no, a poem can make peace, but some language properly used, sonorously used, itself enacts something that may be possible in the public realm in some other way, and it becomes a metaphor for something possible. But this is not to say, how many divisions did the Pope have? That's what Hitler had. You know, we don't have divisions. It's, it's not as though, you know, you, you'd be very careful not to overestimate this power, but it's not nothing. Oh, as regards Bloomsday, you know, one day I was coming home, I forgot it was Bloomsday, and I needed some food, and I went down to Dublin, I was in Dublin, and I, I got, I was coming back from the supermarket with two bags, and all these Blooms people were all out in their boating costumes, their Edwardian costumes, and everybody was somebody, and someone said, who are you? <laughs> and, and they thought it was, they were trying to scroll through Ulysses to see, is there a figure with two bags? <laughs> uh, and there isn't, you know, so I forgot. <laughs> Uh, thank you both very much, um, and this is a bit to both of you. Um, the universities in Cal and Columbia be at the forefront of this are somewhat a microcosm and a laboratory for what's going on in the world around us. And I'm particularly pleased with the transformational classroom scene that you set up. Uh, and you've described the classroom where there is a monitor or a mediator, you know, the teacher, and you've described the individual reading the book individually but so much is going on in between, whether it's out on campus or whether it's in our society, where there isn't a mediator role that we can define, uh, and even more faculty as mediators uh, in the classroom, but, but where there isn't a mediator role and it's people coming out of having read a book into some stormy debate. Um, do you have any ideas, uh, on, I just like to think about ideas, of how you're giving him a role to people in the discussion rather than becoming combatants but rather articulators of that discussion, ways we can bring that into our society because uh, I just think that was a transformational scene that you, that you depicted mm -hmm. in your classroom. Do you want to? Well, I'll just say a word, but uh, I agree. Uh, it was a very powerful evocation of a classroom where uh, the teacher uh, is not the monitor of how students read feel, and even think, certainly feel, uh, and where, in fact, the, uh, the kinds of questions of, of ownership of the interpretive process become shared, uh, delegated, uh, and yet always in the classroom space, to some extent, curated. That has to be one of the functions we have as, as, as teachers. But in which uh, there is a genuine, genuine commitment to a kind of dialogic, uh, and in this case, uh, a, a more broad uh, collective experience of engaging in uh, whatever it might be, reading a novel, reading a poem, reading uh, a work of history. Uh, it is a complicated exchange, uh, and it's one that always uh, uh, has to engage both what might appear to be inside the text and all the stuff that is outside it, whether it's the lives uh, that each individual brings into the classroom, the events of the day, the things that are going on on campus, the things that are going on in the world. I mean, the utopian hope about the university, which, uh, which most of us faculty continue to uphold, even if it seems to be, in some sense, uh, a, a belief in impossibility, is that uh, that, kind of, that kind of engagement, that kind of honesty, that kind of exchange, that commitment uh, to, uh, to understanding how the other, whoever that other might be, whether it's the individual in the classroom, whether it's my colleague as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, uh, another member of the faculty, whether it's uh, uh, any number of the constituents that are part of the university, uh, becomes in some sense uh, the space in which you can, you, can really see, uh, uh, you can really see dialogue. You can really see uh, 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 an effort to understand something more broadly, something out of one's own experience. We see in our political world today how 
how seemingly impossible that aspiration is. We see even in our journalism how segmented uh, the way we read and confirm our views, our interpretations, our thoughts, even our facts uh, might be. But, um, but, but what makes the, the university and what makes uh, this kind of classroom special is precisely uh, an effort to do it differently uh, and to, uh, to create a democracy, uh, a genuine democracy of thought even though we know everything from uh, circumstance, different lives, uh, uh, different forms of power, inequality that is, that is rampant, uh, at some level undermine or at least uh, un seek to unravel uh, that space. But we, we hold on to that belief. And so uh, when the university succeeds, it doesn't always look like it is doing that, uh, but it is uh, succeeding if it tries. I, I mean, I think the business of, of how um, just to start, just uh, two things. One, that how women have, the, women's lives have changed in the university. How there are more women teaching, um, how a, a young woman coming into a classroom, I think has an absolute right to feel that she will be treated as a full equal to, to the blokes in the class. Um, that's something that wasn't there you know, in, in many places 20, 30, 40 years ago. But from my point of view, I, th I think one of the great things about the internet, I think, is the students can Google you before they arrive and they know I'm gay. And I don't go on about it. I don't, you know, give them a big talk about I'm gay, I'm gay, I'm gay. But, but nonetheless, <laughs> it's, it's known. And so that, so that, um, that, that change in life um, it, over the last 30, 40 years about what it, what it would mean to be a gay teacher, what it would mean to be a gay student, I think has really changed. And the university in that case has become a sort of utopian space that someone gay arriving in a university now would feel, I think I'm going to be, it's going to be okay. It's, it might not have been as great in high school, it might not even be great with my family, but I think I'm gonna find a space mm -hmm. where in the classroom, and outside the classroom, I'm going to be treated well. I'm going to be treated equally. And so, that it, so that there has been great progress. And, and I notice the progress in the transgender area is happening in the universities in very interesting ways. Mm -hmm. And so we still have hope that our institutions might actually matter to the world, even though the fees are too high even though there are all sorts of troubles that mentioned in the newspaper all the time. But, but that, if, look, if we don't get this right, if we can't get the universities right, how can we ask you know, politicians to get things right? We have all this time and we've been trained in all these ways, and we have these wonderful libraries. So I'm, um, I, I'm very serious about this idea that, that, um, of the classroom as, as a space not only for learning, but for changing. Hello. Uh, that was um, yeah. That was a very interesting discussion, and I was especially interested in uh, the the part about censorship in Ireland in the 1920s, because uh, in India it has parallels in India as well, because the the nationalist movement, the independence movement, was just taking shape around then. I'm a writer from India, and I was doing research for my last novel, and I went into detail. And there was, uh, you know, the sedition law, which exists in India today, and it's, it's been used by the government. It continues to be in use by the government. Was uh, introduced as the Dramatic Performances Act in 1920. There, so uh, nationalistic messages uh, were, you know, sort of. Uh, so, uh, used in performances in plays, but not overtly. They were sort of covert messages through religious plays, and uh, uh, that that sort of translated into uh, you know modern uh, writing and censorship in India. So I was wondering, the the current government, for example, uh, used uh, these laws uh, against uh, writers. So there was a Tamil writer last year who was uh, threatened by right wing groups, um, protected by the government. And uh, he made an announcement saying that he would stop writing. And uh, it's a shame that these laws are still in use today. They've been distorted. I was wondering if in Ireland there's something like that which, ex which exists and continues to affect writers or continues uh, you know, to be in use by uh, political parties. Um, it's the opposite now. Um, and the opposite is interesting where um, there's a, because of the change in e economic circumstances, people are buying books. And um, so for a new novel, um, 
you know, e even uh, there's a bookshop in every town, and um, and the library system is still intact. And um, the problem is that there's a new novel coming out every few months by a young writer, and people are reading it and savouring it. And and so the, liter the, 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 the literary life in Ireland now has never been as strong in, in, in the relationship between the reader and the writer. And the government is watching this with, with absolute sort of ease. Uh, you know, it, it, there, there's, absolute, there's absolutely no problem at the moment. So there, uh, something has been won. Something has come through after all these years. And um, so, uh, I mean, it's, it's not as... The, you see, freedom is always a problem because no matter what you do, I'll go back to John McGarhern, who, when this sort of subject was raised, said, look, you, you know, your, your only duty is to your sentences. Try and make them as good as possible. And, um, but, but no, the, the, uh, the Irish thing now um, has, has we, we've, we've, won a f we've won a full freedom. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you everyone for coming. I'm afraid that's all that we have time for today.